Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, historian and author Julia Irwin on the long history of U.S. foreign disaster aid. Between the early 20th century and World War II, the American Red Cross was the U.S. government's humanitarian arm. One of the interesting things about disaster relief is that, other than Jamaica, for the most part, um, these things are done by the the invitation and and acceptance of of a government that's been affected. And when a major disaster like this happens, um, many countries, most countries, are keen to kind of welcome immediate assistance. What we call a natural disaster, um, something caused by an earthquake or hurricane, is really about human choices. An earthquake that happens in, say, Japan, which happened fairly recently, may cause relatively few casualties, uh, less destruction than, say, an earthquake that occurs in Haiti. And that's about the political choices that people have made. Julia Irwin, welcome to Chatter. Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad you could join us and talk about one of my favorite topics, which is disasters and their recovery. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? It sounds it really like does. we're celebrating it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it is uh, unfortunately or fortunately become one of my favorite topics too. So, How did you get there? What Did you have a, a personal tragedy that drove you this way or you just read about them and thought, I want to learn more? Yeah, the, well, I'll try to keep it relatively brief, but it actually started when I was researching my dissertation, uh, which was on the First World War. So I was um, interested in humanitarian aid and conflict. Um, but as I was researching the dissertation, I kept seeing sort of instances in the archives of Uh, the American Red Cross, the U.S. government responding to uh, what we often call natural disasters, to earthquakes, Mm -hmm. to uh, hurricanes, to floods in other parts of the world. Um, And so as I kind of finished up that book about a decade ago, the dissertation and and my first book, I decided for the next project to to turn my attention away from wartime disasters and to peacetime disasters. uh, And that's where it all began. Is there a wide and deep community of historians who look at this topic, or is your work as unique as it appears to me? There's a growing number. And, uh, you know, I I think I wrote the book because it hadn't been written. uh, But I really think of myself as kind of existing in a couple of different circles, I think. Um, One is is historians who work on humanitarian aid. And there's a growing number of people, especially over the last decade or so, um, who who really are historians of humanitarian aid internationally, of, of U.S. foreign assistance as well. And then there's a group of uh, people who we often call ourselves disaster studies scholars. So um, historians of disaster, but also sociologists, anthropologists, um, people in other fields as well. So um, I kind of think of it as as sort of the intersection of these two fields as disaster studies and the history of humanitarianism. And it is related to the former topic there, but but different, right? You're, You're not focused on all foreign aid, which takes into account all kinds of things and, and isn't nearly as focused. You you really do focus, at least most recently, on natural disasters and aid to recover and then development afterward, right? That's correct. Yeah. So in this book, I'm I'm very interested in, in um, sort of sudden emergencies, like in earthquakes, uh, hurricanes, floods, these these very sort of sudden events that that can change the course of history, can change the course of people's lives, and often more than you know, no more than an instant. Um, and so these these specific types of disasters, which I think in our in our kind of popular imagination. Um, but there's disaster movies. There's there's this sort of um, this obsession I think that that's longstanding with with things like volcanic eruptions and and the the fate of Pompeii. Um, and I think they've they've been seen differently um, in in American culture and kind of culture globally uh, from other types of crises, for better or for worse. Um, mm-hmm. They've been treated differently for that reason, both kind of um, in the popular imagination, but also in policy planning circles. There's also good reasons for this, right? Uh, that the types of suffering that are caused you know, by this sudden kind of catastrophic event um, are different from the long-term effects of, of, um, of famine, of disease, of, of poverty, for that matter, um, of war. So um, some of the kind of legal and, and cultural differences that separate disasters from other type of crises interest me as well. Some of it feels just personal. That is, I can imagine people across many generations looking at, let's say, news of foreign wars and saying, well, those are choices that those people and those governments are making. And there's there's almost less empathy because of yeah. what comes from the war. Whereas an earthquake or uh, an outbreak of tornadoes or a tsunami or flooding, uh, you know, any of these things, 
you you could picture those things happening to you. And many of us, they have happened to us mm-hmm. or near us. So there, there's almost a, a different mental framework for the yeah. way we think about those. Yeah, there really are. And I, I think you know one of the more interesting ideas coming out of, of disaster studies is this the sense that there is really no such thing as a natural disaster. Um, so what we call mm-hmm. a natural disaster, um, something caused by an earthquake or hurricane, is really about human choices. Um, and by that, it means that um, an earthquake that happens in, say, Japan, which happened fairly recently, may cause relatively few casualties, uh, less destruction than, say, an earthquake that occurs in Haiti. Mm. Um, and that's about the political choices that people have made about um, earthquake planning and zoning and, and how to make earthquake resistant housing, uh, early warning systems, all of these sort of technologies that we can use uh, if we choose or if we have the resources to choose uh, to help um, prevent populations from from suffering long term. Um, that being said, right, as you point out, every day people thinking about these do see them as, as different. They, they empathize with the suffering. Um, I think a lot of times disaster survivors are, are seen as much more blameless uh, for for their own suffering than, than um, survivors of other types of crises. That those moral decisions to provide aid are often less contested than they are for uh, for other types of um, humanitarian crises as well. Yeah, I do want to come back to some of those issues of, you know, cultural representations, pop culture about disasters. But but we'll do that after we've actually laid the foundation right. of the real <laughs> history, uh, as you've detailed in the book you've mentioned: catastrophic diplomacy, U.S. foreign disaster assistance in the American century. It's an interesting take because so many of us have a currency bias. That is, we see the world as it is now and in recent history, and we think, well, this this is what's new and different. This is what matters. But you've done a, a service by looking and saying that, no, 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 when it comes to foreign disaster assistance in the United States, that it has a much longer history than is, is commonly believed. Uh, you go all the way back to James Madison. And <laughs> even as a student of the US presidency and looking at a lot of U.S. foreign policy issues related to the presidency, I have to say, it had never occurred to me that it would go back to the Madison administration that the United States would provide foreign aid to a natural disaster to another country. I mean, we we were barely functioning as a government in some important ways at that point. So what was the incident in, in 1812 and how did the U.S. respond? Yeah, so um, believe me, I was as surprised as you are in some of what I have found and learned uh, in the process. Um, in 1812, there was a major earthquake in Caracas and Venezuela and the surrounding areas. Um, this is an interesting moment in, in world history. Uh, Venezuela had declared their independence from Spain recently. It's the beginning of this wave of, of revolutions um, against the Spanish Empire throughout much of uh, Central and South America. And Americans were watching, U.S. Americans and the United States were, were kind of aware of all that's going on. Um, and then this major earthquake happens that destroys Caracas. Americans didn't learn about it for quite a while. It takes a long time uh, in 1812 for news of, of complete destruction of a city to reach U.S. ports by ship. But uh, when it did, when news did arrive in, in Washington, it really sparked a lot of discussion in Congress. Uh, reading the congressional documents uh, from that time, there's a lot of conversation about whether the United States should aid uh, Venezuelans or not. Uh, and ultimately, the, um, the majority decision was, yes, uh, the United States should provide some assistance to survivors of this crisis. Um, for some, uh, at least rhetorically, it was uh, a duty to humanity, um, this idea that Americans owed it to each other. Um, there were certainly Pan-American sentiments um, swirling around this sort of uh, this this age of revolutions and, and concern for um, other potential revolutionaries um, inspired a lot of Americans to provide assistance. Some saw it as a way to help support um, you know, a fellow would-be republic um, without alienating Spain too much. Um, this, this idea that if you provide aid in a disaster, it's different from providing, say, aid to revolutionaries fighting a war against uh, a major empire. For all of these reasons, moral and strategic um, made the decision to commit $50,000 and send uh, shiploads of um, food and other aid to, to Venezuela. Of course, it arrived long after the actual disaster had occurred. Sure. It's, uh, I think, about three months before the aid actually reached there, just in, because of the timing and everything like that. Um, but it, it marked the first instance of um, the U.S. government making a contribution of assistance to survivors of a foreign disaster. And in there, you've you've previewed several themes that I think we'll hit on and notice the changes uh, temporally here. 
uh, you've touched on strategic, that, that there is a political issue here, not just a humanitarian one, um, but there are perceptions of humanitarian assistance and the role of the U.S. government in helping in foreign countries, which comes up. There's the issues of transportation and technology that come up. So the, the, these themes will be coming back. Uh, you note that for most of the rest of the 19th century, however, the U.S. government was not consistently uh, providing major U.S. foreign disaster aid, that it wasn't until the 1880s and really the 1890s that a confluence of factors came together that that led to a turn that allowed what we'll get to, which is a, a massive case from 1902. But in the 1880s, 1890s, it actually had started because of several factors relating to technology, transportation, U.S. interests. Talk through a few of those and help us understand what changed in the last couple of decades of the 19th century to set up what you call the American century of uh, disaster assistance. Yeah, so throughout much of the 19th century, after after the 1812 earthquake, the federal government remains quite small. Um, it doesn't have a very large overseas footprint. Uh, there are not that many diplomats and consuls abroad. There are not that many U.S. embassies. Uh, the U.S. military remains quite small, relatively speaking. Starting in yeah the, the last quarter or so of the, the 19th century, a lot of that begins to change. Um, the the U.S. government after the Civil War um, becomes uh, stronger and more centralized. Um, it begins to engage with other nations and empires in a way that it hadn't. Um, you start to see the number of uh, diplomats and consuls increasing in various parts of the world, um, especially by the 1890s. Uh, there's, there's a commitment to building up the U.S. Navy and by all accounts, the U.S. becomes an overseas empire um, in, in 1898. Um, so following the Spanish-American War, the U.S. government um, maintains control of Puerto Rico, uh, the Philippines, and um, militarily occupies Cuba uh, until um, the early 20th century and then retains control over Guantanamo Bay. So this really changes the U.S. government's overseas footprint. All of a sudden, you have both diplomats and uh, military forces uh, stationed around the world in ways they hadn't been before. Uh, you have a permanent presence of, of the U.S. military in the Philippines, in Puerto Rico, uh, in Guantanamo. Uh, within a few years, this would also extend to the Canal Zone and Panama, following the U.S. acquisition of that territory. Um, and suddenly you just have people on the scene. So when disasters um, in other places occur, there's more likely to be someone there uh, ready to respond. Um, if they're not sort of there on the ground, uh, there's a greater likelihood than there had been in the 19th century uh, that the U.S. Navy will be able to get there more quickly, hmm. that news will be able to spread more quickly as well. Um, and again, this, this issue of technology really interests me, that you know, sort of telegraph wires make it possible uh, for right. someone in Washington to know that a disaster has happened. Um, not in weeks, but in you know, hours or, or days in some cases. Yeah, that technology side is fascinating. It's about, it's about communication. It's about information, right? You could hear about it more quickly. So it mm -hmm. feels more real perhaps than in previous centuries where it was almost like that's something that happened in the past, not something yeah. that's happening now. Mm -hmm. But also the ability to respond, right? Mm -hmm. Steamships, you know, yeah. <laughs> getting, getting there faster. Uh, it reminds me of some of the good histories that have been written about the impact of railroads on so many issues having to do with economics and society. Um, but for disaster relief, it, it obviously is a real issue. Um, there's also the creation of an organization that I think we take for granted. And mm -hmm. at, least, at least for me as an American, it, it mm -hmm. never occurred to me that there wasn't the American Red Cross, mm -hmm. but it was created in this time period, right? Sometime in the, in the 1880s? That's right. Yeah. And my, my first book actually was was about the American Red Cross and its role, especially in World War One. But um, it's its role as um, essentially the humanitarian arm or auxiliary of the U.S. government. Um, we don't tend to realize this now, I think, in the 21st century. Um, but between the early 20th century and World War Two, the American Red Cross was the U.S. government's humanitarian arm. The American Red Cross was founded in 1881. Uh, the U.S. was actually a late entry into the International Red Cross Movement, uh, which, which was founded in the 1860s. But in 1881, the American Red Cross was founded by a woman named Claire Barton, who many of us learn about in, in elementary school. Uh, it took, though, another 20 years or so before um, Congress granted the American Red Cross its first 
uh, charter. So it was uh, chartered by Congress in 1900 and then again in 1905. Um, and it's really at this point, the early 20th century moving forward, um, that the American Red Cross becomes um, this, this really powerful partner to the U.S. government in foreign assistance, not only for disasters, but also in times of war. In the early 20th century, the, following this charter, its headquarters were actually in the State War and Navy Building. Uh, so literally right down the hallway from yep. you know, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of War, was the American Red Cross's offices. Uh, they remained there until World War I when they built um, their own permanent headquarters building um, in D.C., which was conveniently just a couple of blocks away. But the American Red Cross's leaders collaborate and, and really um, are in intense discussions um, with U.S. government officials whenever disasters occur in other places. They exchange information about the American Red Cross receives from the State Department information about what's going on, about the U.S.'s strategic interests in these regions, uh, whether uh, it would be in the national interest to respond. Uh, and then the American Red Cross, in turn, um, raises money from, from the public, has disaster experts who become involved, um, and really partners with the government to, to respond to all of these issues. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's, it's founding and especially it's, it's um, achieving this congressional charter in the early 20th century really transform the U.S. government's ability to respond to disasters abroad. And this all sets up the first big case that I want to talk about. And this is the 1902 explosion, um, the volcanic eruption of Mount Pele and Martinique in the Caribbean, which reading about now, it's just it's just shocking that this isn't better known with, you know, at least 30,000 people dead and over 50,000 people who had to flee uh, the capital and the areas around it. And close enough to the US that there was this, this feeling because of what we just talked about the technology, and all of this that we can do something. So Talk a little bit about the immediate reaction to this. And then what I found fascinating is the debate over what responsibility do we have as Americans to help others uh, and, and how much do we need to commit to it? Yeah. So 1902, uh, it's, it's 90 years since the, the um, Caracas uh, earthquake. And these, these trends that I was sort of talking about earlier in the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, the, the expansion of um, the U.S.'s overseas footprint, um, its, its um, acquisition of territories, uh, the growth of the U.S. federal government, all of these together uh, will really shape um, the U.S.'s response to this crisis. Theodore Roosevelt has recently become president in 1902 following the, the assassination of, of uh, McKinley. And... Um, when this uh, volcanic eruption happens, um, news comes pretty quickly uh, from uh, from the Caribbean to to the United States, and it really becomes this uh, sensational story. Um, American news headlines all over the country are reporting about this tragedy. Um, they're comparing it to a modern day Pompeii, and they're really they're captivated by what's what's happening in the region. Once again, you have um, a lot of people in Congress who become very interested in this disaster, and they debate whether the United States should respond. There are some who argue that it shouldn't. Uh, they say this is not the federal government's responsibility to spend American tax dollars in this way. Um, you know, the United States should be focusing on its own citizens, not the citizens of another empire. Martinique was, was uh, a part of the French empire as well. But the majority disagree. Um, much like in Caracas 90 years earlier, they say that the United States has a humanitarian obligation uh, to aid these people. Others argue that um, it's a way for the United States to show itself as one of the great powers um, by providing assistance to France, this um, potential, this this ally. Uh, the United States can demonstrate its, its, its um, amity uh, towards the French Empire. Uh, towards other people in the Caribbean, by, by responding to this disaster, it can show the strength of its government, of its military. Uh, and so for these reasons, um, Congress passes a fairly substantial aid package to Martinique. Um, it becomes it's $200,000 uh, worth of assistance. Theodore Roosevelt had actually asked for more. Uh, he had asked for $500,000, and it was kind of negotiated down. But this allows the United States to send ships loaded with military supplies and other aids so or rations and, and kind of food. Some of them go from the United States, but uh, others are going from, from U.S. territories in the Caribbean. Uh, so this, this proximity um, 
from places like Puerto Rico and Guantanamo allows the United States to get aid there relatively quickly. In this case, the United States actually comes to the American Red Cross and asks them for, uh, for help as well. But it's this transitional period where the American Red Cross is still, uh, it has just gotten its first congressional charter, uh, and it's not quite um, the, the large organization that it would become. Uh, so the American Red Cross ends up not participating um, very extensively in this disaster, but the U.S. government does partner with other um, organizations, the New York Merchants Association, for instance, to respond to this crisis. Theodore Roosevelt, meanwhile, is writing to his, his um, counterparts in France, uh, as is the Secretary of State. So they're really kind of making these, these uh, diplomatic connections um, about this disaster, too. What's interesting to me is that you can totally recognize the political debate, right? The This is what we propose. This is the, the executive taking action and Congress, you know, ha- haggling over the amounts and all of this. What I don't get a good sense of, and and I guess this is your job as a historian, but it's hard, is figuring out what the the public opinion, the societal reaction was. Uh, obviously, you know, there was some reaction to the event itself, but do you have any sense of how the public viewed this as a somewhat different, right? That there had been aid before, but not at this scale. How did the public react to the government acting on their behalf, devoting so much in terms of energy and human resources to this disaster? Yeah. One of the one of the interesting things about researching in this period, um, it probably happens today as well, but a lot of people sit down and write letters um, to their um, to their representatives. Sometimes, a lot of times, they write letters to the Secretary of State directly, um, as well as to the President. So there's these really you um, don't do that every day, Julia, because no, that's that's how I spend most of my time. Written letters in cursive, beautiful cursive. Right. Um, but no, no. So there's um, in a lot of these disasters, you really you know it's not public opinion polls, but you can certainly get a sense of what many of um, the American public are kind of thinking. Um, there's also a lot of editorials. Um, so a lot of newspapers publishing editorials about um, about the sense of, of whether okay. the U.S. should respond. Uh, and again, by and large, much like in Congress, there are the debates and there are people who um, are making this argument that, no, this is, you know, these are our tax dollars. The United States shouldn't be responding. Um, but the majority of, of those voices that I saw um, were much more in support saw this as as a reasonable way for, um, again, in the interests of, of humanity, uh, saw this as as part of the United States' really obligations as, as a world power. Um, there's a lot of that sense there, too. Um, and I think a lot of this is spurred, again, by just the, the popular um, obsession in some ways with with this disaster. It's 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 hard to kind of convey what what those newspaper headlines looked like. But every day for for weeks, um, uh, the, the Martinique eruption was was headline news. Um, and part of that is uh, the people who were affected by it were initially cut off. Um, there's this um, sense of, of you know, nobody really knows entirely what had happened. They knew there had been this large volcanic eruption that clearly, you know, people were affected. Uh, probably a lot of people were were killed. Um, but news kind of starts creeping in gradually about numbers, about deaths, about what had happened. Uh, and people are really paying attention. Um, after the disaster leaves the headlines, uh, it continues to be reported on in, in mass market magazines. Um, and I think what's most fascinating is that, um, I don't know when it opened, but shortly after, you could go to Coney Island and you could ride a, um, a ride that was about the Mount Pele eruption. Uh, so it, it enters the popular imaginary and this just really kind of um, it becomes this uh, this disaster that really captivates the public's attention. Uh, and for that reason, you know, I think a lot of people are, are eager to give. Um, and, and maybe we can talk about this a little bit later, but there are certain disasters that do this um, yeah. for whatever reason. Maybe it's about timing. Maybe it's just about you know, the proximity. It's about the sense of, of connection. Uh, it depends. But some disasters really do spark the imagination of a, the American populace in ways that others don't uh, and make people more interested and willing to aid as well. Absolutely. And I mean, even in this conversation, I guarantee you, there'll be some listeners who hear some of the cases we talk about and say, oh yeah, you know, that, that one resonates mm-hmm. with me. Yeah. And even, you know, exceedingly well-educated students of the world, people who have traveled around, there will probably be some that people say, huh, you know, I, I may vaguely remember that, yeah. but for some reason, it just doesn't stick. Um, and there's 
there's one of those we'll get we'll get to soon, which I was a bit surprised by. I think I, I in my best moments, I want to say, yeah, sure, I was aware of that, but I honestly don't remember any of the details. So you, you re-educated me about a major world event that I <laughs> certainly wasn't alive for, but I feel like I should have known more about because of just being generally aware. Um, one of the aspects of this that we haven't touched on yet is the recipient side. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's this urge growing among Americans in the government and these these three pillars that you, uh, as a historian, impose order on these events by saying, well, you have to look at these pillars of the diplomatic response through the State Department and its agents. You have to look at the military response through much of this time through the War Department and the Navy Department, eventually the Department of Defense. And then you need to look at the U.S. government's cooperation with delegation to whatever you want to call it with voluntary organizations, uh, primarily the American Red Cross, but as you pointed out with Martinique, not exclusively with the American Red Cross. But that's all on, if you will, uh, our side, the, the American side and the decision to do it and how to implement it. But the recipient side, it seems easy and also naive to think, well, everybody will just be perfectly happy to have the Americans come in and help. But the case of Jamaica in 1907 showed that wasn't the case. Massive earthquake uh, hitting Kingston. Um, what were the diplomatic troubles involved in the aid there? Yeah, the Jamaica incident, as it became known. Um, actually, I learned about this quite early and in, in the research. There had been a really terrific article in Diplomatic History um, written um, a number of years ago uh, that, that kind of called attention to, to this disaster as well. Um, I wrote about parts of it, too, for, for the book. But essentially, in a nutshell, um, in 1907, uh, so five years after Martinique, there's a major earthquake in Kingston and Jamaica, which is at that point a British uh, British colony. And you know, it, it initially follows a very similar trajectory as the U.S. response to Martinique. Um, mm -hmm. The U.S. government is, is interested in responding. Um, there's Navy forces stationed fairly nearby in U.S. territories uh, who go to Kingston to offer assistance. Um, the best we can tell is that there was a little bit of miscommunication uh, when the U.S. Navy arrives. The governor at the time uh, had, uh, his name was uh, Swettenham, had retired um, to his, his mansion sort of outside the city to, to escape all that was going on. Uh, and his you know, right-hand man um, talks to the U.S. Navy um, and says, oh, yeah, you can, you know, thanks for your, you know, we appreciate your assistance. You're welcome to, to come and assist uh, so the U.S. Navy lands um, uh, several hundred sailors, and they begin taking part in relief efforts. Um, they include, you know, helping to dig people out from from the rubble and providing aid, um, but also things like helping to put down a prison mutiny. Uh, so you have um, armed U.S. sailors who are who are um, essentially policing prisoners who are trying to escape. It's it's you know a lot of chaos in the midst of all this. Um, they're uh, in some points uh, also destroying buildings that look like they're about to fall over um, in their minds because it's safer. So all of this is sort of happening, and then the uh, the governor um, gets wind of this and and really becomes quite irate. Um, says you know I did not give my permission for you to land. Um, you know, several hundred armed uh, U.S. sailors uh, in in this territory. Uh, he has his very kind of caustic remarks. You know what what, what would have happened if the British Navy had landed uh, in in New York or um, uh, recently the the 1906 San Francisco earthquake had happened. Um, and so he kind of makes these 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 arguments that you know you can't land on our territory without my permission, right? This is this is a sovereign territory. This is not you know a place the United States can invade. Um, so it leads to this essentially leads to this major um, diplomatic imbroglio, kerfuffle, whatever you want to call it, between uh, the U.S. and the U.K. Um, Roosevelt uh, and his uh, State Department and their counterparts in Britain are going back and forth about, you know, who should apologize for this incident. And then Roosevelt is very steadfast that the United States does not, must not apologize Um and it's really, it's it's really this this mess um, that that kind of occurred essentially because of, by all accounts, miscommunication over whether the U.S. Navy was allowed to to land or not. Yeah, it's a weird mix, like like all of these events of the personal and yeah. the grand strategic at the same time. So yeah. <laughs> you have you have these issues of empire and pride and yeah. sovereignty, mm -hmm. but also just I don't I don't want to say peevishness, but it certainly just seems like the wrong 
the wrong person perceiving something the wrong way makes makes a huge difference and has a cascading effect. On, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. You know. Well, the big the big event I referred to earlier um, that that I would like to say I knew about, but I can't recall the details, and I think <laughs> it's sad that my memory isn't this good. Was the Southern Italian earthquake and tsunami of nineteen oh eight, which reading the details of it, it's it's absolutely tragic and devastating, both for the southern tip of uh, the Italian mainland, but especially for northern Sicily. Mm -hmm. um, talk about the events there and how so many of these elements we've talked about really came mm -hmm. together and led to, if you will, a longer mission than most of these previous efforts in terms of rebuilding and employing survivors. The, the Messina earthquake really is the largest and longest um, U.S. international disaster relief operation in history. So um, this occurs in late 1908, um, right after, you know, it's late December 28th, 29th. Um, and essentially a major earthquake occurs in the Strait of Messina, which is the waterway that, that separates Sicily from the, the mainland of Italy. This underwater earthquake creates a major tsunami, um, which um, just washes out Messina, uh, Reggio di Calabria, um, as well as a lot of the surrounding towns and villages. Hundreds of thousands of people um, are, are killed immediately by, by the tsunami, by crumbling buildings. The, the, the devastation is just appalling, right? It's kind of really hard to kind of uh, wrap our heads around some of these things. This is a really interesting moment. Uh, so Roosevelt has just been, or um, he's, he's leaving office after his second term, and Taft has just been elected, but he won't be inaugurated until March, based on the, the earlier calendars. So it's at this moment uh, in, in Roosevelt's kind of lame duck period um, that the U.S. decides to, to respond. Um, and this disaster, even more so than the one in Martinique, really, really captures the public's imagination. Um, this occurs, it's about two and a half years after the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906. Um, a lot of Americans and the public are kind of seeing this disaster in Italy through the eyes of, of people who have just lived through one of their own worst national disasters. There's a large Italian-American community in the United States at this point. Um, this is kind of this era when you have a large scale Italian immigration to the United States, many from Southern Italy. So there are a lot of people who have relatives, uh, friends in the region. Um, there's also just a lot of um, what we might call Italophilic Americans who are, are really interested in, in all things Europe and all things Italy and what's going on. Um, and for all these reasons, just the, the public response is really um, extraordinary. Uh, the American Red Cross by this point has become um, a more established organization, um, but this disaster really helps the organization make its mark in foreign disaster relief. Um, they launch a fundraising campaign, uh, which, which Roosevelt supports, and it brings in um, just a really astounding amount of money uh, within a short period of time. Um, the Roosevelt administration essentially urges the American public to donate all of its money, not to small regional groups or to their churches, but to funnel all that money into the American Red Cross. And a lot of people do. Uh, not everyone, but many people do. Uh, so the American Red Cross amasses really large scale donations. Uh, Congress as well um, will commit $800,000 to the disaster, which um, you know, doesn't sound like all that much today, but at the time was a fairly significant um, you know, outpouring for, for citizens of another country. Um, and all of this allows the U.S. to really administer this, this large program of, of not only relief, but what actually becomes uh, rebuilding and reconstruction. So for the first month or so after the disaster, um, a lot of the, the focus is on short-term emergency relief. Um, the U.S. sends um, agents to the region who are distributing food and trying to, to assist um, in a matter of really fortuitous timing. Uh, the Great White Fleet arrives on the scene. Uh, so Roosevelt, you know, a year before, had sent uh, the Atlantic Fleet on this famous worldwide you know, mission of, to spread goodwill and to show the, the power of the U.S. Navy. Um, they happen to be uh, heading through the um, essentially through the Suez Canal uh, about when this uh, when this earthquake occurs. Um, so they're just a few days away, and uh, the commander sends four battleships and some auxiliary ships to assist as well. Uh, so the Navy shows up, and Navy sailors are helping to dig people out of the rubble. Um, all of this is happening in the kind of early first, first few weeks after the disaster. 
once the immediate emergency starts to subside, though, a few weeks later, um, there's still a lot of money left. Um, and the uh, ambassador at the time, uh, the State Department, Congress, uh, the American Red Cross, everyone was saying, well, what, what should we do with, with all of this extra money? Um, and they end up deciding to use it for uh, reconstruction and rebuilding projects, um, or at least temporary housing projects. Um, the New York Times really saw this as um, one of the headlines I remember seeing was that this is an innovation in relief, this idea that you would actually spend money uh, to build houses and not just to you know, provide short-term shelter. But they end up doing a number of things. Um, Congress, um, with the Congress congressional donation, uh, helps to fund um, a number of shiploads of, of lumber, uh, as well as some carpenters from the United States um, that are sent to Southern Italy to help rebuild houses. Um, uh, they build a hotel, they build schools, they build a hospital as well. Um, they build an orphanage for, for children. And I should note that the United States was not the only country doing this. Um, it was one of several um, uh, other, other countries, mostly European countries, uh, that are also building their own sort of, um, they often call them villages. There's the Swiss village and the, the American village and the Russian village. Um, but this idea of kind of helping to, to build temporary housing in the region Mm -hmm. um, becomes uh, part of um, the relief effort. Um, it ends up lasting about six months after um, after the the original earthquake, um, but it's a pretty extraordinary just um, amount of involvement in in this other country's um, relief and rebuilding efforts. And as compared to the Jamaican case we just mentioned, w was there any diplomatic trouble either from the Italian government or conflicts with any of these other international efforts going on? Yeah, I would say not not quite as uh, blatant as, as in Jamaica, but yeah, very much. Um, and I think one of the interesting things about disaster relief in this case, but also in, in so many others, um, is that other than Jamaica, for the most part, um, these things are done by the, the invitation and, and acceptance of, of a government that's been affected. So typically the U.S. government does not simply, you know, rush in and then, you know, invade with, with assistance as a was perceived to have happened in Jamaica. Um, but there's an offer of assistance made to the Italian government, which um, says yes, um, and allows this, this USAID to come in, um, and other foreign aid. Um, and when a major disaster like this happens, um, many countries, most countries, are keen to kind of welcome immediate assistance. Um, one of the things I've, I've noticed in researching is that those sort of early days after a disaster, when the immediate assistance is coming in and everyone mm -hmm. is sort of in a state of shock and in real, real dire need, um, there tends to be kind of less, um, less tensions, less problems. But the longer these things kind of continue, the more tensions and disagreements arise. And this was certainly the case in Italy. Mm -hmm. By a few weeks in, you start to see um, uh, kind of some some tension, some conflicts between, say, the U.S. Navy and um, it, the Italian Navy, um, the Italian military as well, who is trying to kind of regain control over you know its own uh, disaster relief efforts and not wanting to be overshadowed um, by by the U.S. and other other nations' navies. One of my favorite sort of sources was finding um, uh, a logbook uh, of the U.S. Navy ships that are there. And essentially, this logbook has um, the punishments for for sailors uh, who have done things. Um, so all of them are a lot of them are getting drunk. They're going on shore leave and they're getting drunk. And who knows what they're doing? Some of them are getting arrested. Um, it's not really the best, um, you know, the best uh, way to make a good impression on people you're supposed to be helping um, by essentially uh, treating it as as a party. Um, so for these reasons, tensions start start to grow. Um, there's also just a lot of condescension, um, not mm -hmm. by all, but by a lot of American diplomats towards the people they're supposed to be assisting. And not just um, perceived condescension, there's yeah. there's actual <laughs> condescension. Yes, very blatant, and especially in private correspondence, but you can imagine this sort of coming out in, in um, people's interactions as well. Um, but this is a time when, as I mentioned, there's large-scale Italian immigration to the United States. Um, many people in the United States, um, many sort of you know, Anglo-Americans, see Italians and especially Southern Italians um, as, as ethnically inferior. Um, and they talk about them in their writings. Uh, they, they talk about the, the laziness and the idleness of, of people who have just suffered this major disaster, um, but, but talk about it as if it's part of the, the Italian you know, character, the Sicilian character. Um, so there's a lot of really derogatory remarks yeah. um, and beliefs that, that Italians are not doing enough to um, aid their own recovery. 
Mm. These pompous attitudes on the part of some, not all, but but some of the U.S. diplomats involved um, really you know, alienate uh, a lot of people on the scene as well for, for good reason. And that's a tension that has never gone away. I mean, we hear it even today when we talk about relief efforts, domestic as well as international, is, you know, what's the burden on the collective to help people help themselves versus how much do they need to, in the old phrase, pull up the bootstraps and, and yep. do it. So that Absolutely. that doesn't go away. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we, we mentioned a bit, you know, the rise in U.S., you know, global presence and international interests uh, really beginning in the 1880s. But it really took off with the First World War and the mm-hmm. aftermath. What was the effect of the First World War on U.S. foreign disaster assistance? Yeah, so the First World War changes everything about American society. Um, and you had mentioned, and I appreciate you mentioning these these three pillars of disaster aid that I that I really structure the book around, um, which are the, the State Department and its agents, the U.S. military, um, and then the uh, especially the American Red Cross, but other other partners in the voluntary sector. During World War I, each of these really transform in, in profound ways. Um, the U.S. military becomes the, um, the, you know, the, this, um, this major mobilization of the U.S. military after U.S. entry into the war in 1917 uh, changes uh, certainly the shape of the U.S. military. And although it um, will become much smaller once the war ends, uh, it really does have this kind of um, longer term effect. Um, the U.S. government begins to play more of a role um, in world affairs in World War One in, in ways that it was beginning to do in the early 20th century. But involvement in the First World War really uh, cements the U.S.'s standing as, as a world power and a major player in European affairs uh, and world affairs more broadly. Um, the American Red Cross during this conflict, uh, this is really the conflict that, that transforms the American Red Cross from an important player in U.S. foreign assistance to the essential, uh, the essential kind of um, uh, organization. Uh, during the war, the American Red Cross becomes the nation's just uh, largest humanitarian organization. Um, millions of Americans join the organization. They, they give extraordinary levels of money. Um, it's something like 400, and this is, this is for the time, $400 million um, donated over the course of the war to the American Red Cross. And I remember learning this when I was writing my that's, first book that's and massive, saying, given that can't the be right. Value yeah, 100 years ago. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's this really extraordinary and it changes the American Red Cross's ability to operate even after the war. Um, and so all of these sort of events together sort of change each of these, these parts of, um, of the government and its, its um, auxiliaries um, and the ways that they're able to respond to disasters in, in other nations too. So it's, it's this kind of watershed moment as the second world war will be later as well. In the, in the interwar period, there's uh, two things I'd like to get your take on. One is the, I guess the, the somewhat different polls going on. One poll of course is in the very late twenties, thirties, the great depression, and the dampening effect that has on the mm-hmm. ability and willingness to help people worldwide when there's so much suffering within the United States. But at the same time, you have the the good neighbor policy, as it was called, mm-hmm. that is this, this effort to actually reach out to and be more friendly to the countries within the Western Hemisphere, um, as opposed to what had happened in the previous decades of at least perceived and in most cases, actual um, US over paternalism, we'll call it. Um, so on one hand, on one hand, I'd like you to talk about the the tension between those and how that affected foreign assistance. And then outside of the hemisphere, of course, one of the greatest natural disasters in the last hundred years, I think it is about a hundred years right now, which was the uh, great Kanto earthquake in Japan in 1923, and how those dynamics played out during a period where you had this weird confluence of factors from the rise of U.S. global influence after the First World War to the retrenchment to this still feeling of good neighborly policy and then eventually the Depression, even though that hadn't kicked in in 23. So talk through this whole interwar period using those as your real you know, marks for what was going on. Yeah, there's there's a sense, I think, in, in the popular imagination that the 1920s and 30s are this period of American isolationism from world affairs. I think the story we often um, are told in in, high school history classes and that that we often tell ourselves is that 
after World War I, um, people retreated from Wilsonianism and became isolated until World War II convinced them to come back onto the scene. And that's an obviously a simplistic reading. Um, but in reality, it's, you know, I, I think historians today um, tend to concur that this is much too simplistic a reading. To be sure, the United States pulled back on some of the, the broader commitments um, that the Wilson administration had urged them to take, especially most notably participation in the League of Nations. Um, but the United States remained involved in world affairs in all sorts of ways um, during the 1920s and 1930s. Um, it was the world's largest um, leading economic power after the war. The role of, of bankers and financiers and trade keep the United States connected to the world. Um, American missionaries are involved in parts of the world. American companies are exporting their, their, their products and their goods. Um, and there are a lot of American diplomats and politicians who are involved in, in world affairs in different ways. Um, they're, they're involved in movements for ending war. Uh, the outlawry of war movement is really prominent in the 20s and 30s. Um, so, uh, and they're involved in, in diplomatic conferences, uh, most notably the Washington Naval Conference, um, which happens shortly after World War I uh, in, in Washington. Um, so this is all sort of to begin uh, this, this lead off by saying that the United States was never isolated um, from world affairs in, in the interwar period. Um, and this was very true when it came to disaster relief as well. After the war ends, the United States um, kind of returns to um, and starts to build on these foundations that had been laid in the early 20th century. Um, and if anything, starts providing more disaster assistance more often um, to other countries and nations, um, especially during the 1920s. Um, and Japan becomes one of these really, um, really amazing examples of this. Um, and the Japanese story um, is, is a really fantastic one. I'll start there. It is so fascinating too, just because the dynamics are different than with so many others, right? With Jamaica and Martinique and Italy, the, the United States had, I don't know what you want to say, a friendly relationship or at least a neutral one. But with Japan, there, there were rising tensions already as the Naval Conference, you know, uh, highlighted in some ways. And you had some real issues that I hope you'll talk about involving how that affected distribution of aid. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it is this really interesting moment. Um, Japan is also a, a rising world power, much like the United States. Um, and there's a lot of, in the post-World War I period, um, a kind of, a lot of, of um, debates, discussions, you know, about what what Japan's role in world affairs will be. Um, many Japanese um, uh, diplomats and then politicians felt slighted um, after the Washington Naval Conference, which essentially granted um, more power and recognition to um, to other great powers over Japan in terms of, of um, the size of the Navy it was allowed to, to keep. Um, this is also a period in the United States where many Americans are lobbying vociferously uh, against um, Japanese immigration um, and, and um, immigration more broadly, but um, really trying to bar further Japanese immigration to the United States. Um, there's a lot of anti-Japanese racism and protests, especially on the West Coast. Um, so this disaster occurs in this context in September 1923. Um, and in a somewhat surprising uh, turn of events, Americans rush to provide aid um, to this disaster. Um, there's a historian named J. Charles Schenking uh, who has written uh, a wonderful book on the Great Kanto Earthquake, and he's actually working on a book on the American response to it. So he's, oh. um, I have a chapter in my book, but he's, he's working currently on a, a full book, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, but, uh, and he's written a few articles. Um, but as, as he and, and I write about, um, this disaster by by dollar amounts um, is um, unmatched to this day how much uh, the American public ended up giving to this disaster. Um, Americans give millions and millions of dollars to to assist um, the the survivors of this earthquake. Uh, the U.S. government uh, under Calvin Coolidge, uh, who has just become president a few weeks before, uh, becomes incredibly uh, involved. They they send. Um, uh, U.S. military um, supplies from the Philippines, the U.S. territory. Uh, they send ships from the Philippines as well as from the United States uh, to to assist uh, survivors there. Um, the American Red Cross, again, uh, raises something like $11 million um, for uh, this aid effort. 
and all of this really helps to um, they're they're buying up food, they're shipping supplies, just this, this outpouring of aid uh, from the United States. One of the interesting things in this disaster, though, is as the the aid starts to to arrive, um, the U.S. ambassador at the time is actually you know I think he was one of I think the more really interesting uh, characters um, that I was able to kind of learn about and, and study in this book, and he really has this awareness, um, unlike a lot of his compatriots, of, of the the complexities of, of the issue uh, the issues. Uh, he's certainly not. Um, he, I think, is much more respectful of um, of the Japanese people, of the Japanese government, of Japanese interests uh, than many of, of his fellow Americans. Um, compared to that ambassador in, in Italy, he's actually much more kind of culturally sensitive as well. Um, and he kind of realizes early on that, um, you know, if uh, he has this sort of statement, if the United States comes in the way it often does and just, you know, take tries to take over, uh, and then tries to take over the aid effort, um, this is going to be really perceived as, as a slight, and we need to hold back. Um, we need to um, essentially partner with the Japanese government. We need to listen to what their needs, their desires are. We don't need to land a bunch of people ashore um, without permission. Uh, we need to kind of follow uh, follow the, the Japanese government's lead. Um, and in large part, they do, uh, especially kind of Early on, uh, all this aid begins to arrive, but much most of it is turned over to the Japanese government and the Japanese Earthquake Relief Bureau. Um, unlike in a lot of other disasters where um, American officials demand to kind of have control over the aid that is distributed, um, they make the decision to um, to give up that control, um, and it really does help to. Um, cultivate this this sense of, of amity. Um, there's a lot of um, discussion, both from um, U.S. government officials, but also um, their Japanese counterparts. Um, there's a lot of really positive remarks about how this disaster is going to improve U.S.-Japanese relations. Um, how it's showing that um, you know these these two nations can can partner, can be allies, can be, you know, friends and, and, and really equals uh, in this response. And there's a lot of hope um, among diplomats on the scene, especially um, that this will lead to long-term improvements in U.S.-Japanese relations, um, at least initially, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Yeah. It's a great case study, as, as many of these are, a great case study because it does, you know, again, show the influence of the personalities as well as these strategic points um, but the, the, the bigger legacy for the organizations themselves seems to have been the Second World War, that, that in the aftermath of the Second World War, there appeared to be more of a, for lack of a better word, a centralization of U.S. foreign disaster assistance. Talk, talk through that. What did the experience of World War II give to the American government and American people when it came to this? And how did that manifest in the years and decades after in terms of how it organized itself to meet these needs? Mm -hmm. um, and kind of leading up to World War II, um, you know, in the aftermath of the, the great Kanto earthquake in 1923, um, the U.S. government and military and Red Cross continue providing assistance much as they had before. Um, there, there's a lot of sort of similarities to the early 20th century. There are more disaster relief efforts kind of more frequently. Um, they're becoming kind of more routine and a routine part of U.S. foreign relations. Um, but there's a lot of kind of similarities. The Red Cross is still providing much of the funding, um, much of the kind of oversight. Uh, the State Department is still taking the lead, but um, often, you know, for the most part, it's, it's sort of these shorter term relief efforts um, and not not more longer, the, the sort of longer term reconstruction efforts are, are rarer um, and fewer and far between. Um, what changes in World War II is, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, World War II, I think, is a, um, it's it's World War I um, to, to the extreme, right? So all of the things I mentioned in World War I uh, happen even more so, uh, far more so, arguably, in, in World sure. War II. Um, you see this massive expansion of, of the U.S. military, um, and unlike in World War I, when the U.S. military kind of reverts to a much smaller peacetime footing, um, this isn't going to happen after World War II. Um, the U.S. military does demobilize and become smaller, but then the, the onset of the Cold War in the late 1940s uh, essentially encourages and, and propels a remilitarization of, of, um, of the United States. What, what one scholar has called the warfare state um, essentially becomes a, a permanent condition. 
Uh, the U.S. military goes from ha having, I think it's like something like 14 overseas military bases to, at the end of the war, uh, owning or having access rights to 2,000 um, military bases and installations around the world. Uh, this number will shrink and then kind of fluctuate. Um, but essentially, the U.S. military is um, what some have called a basing empire or it's, it's, it's an empire of bases um, is, is really you know, doesn't go away after World War II. And it has this footprint all over the world um, that it didn't have before. Um, the State Department expands in size and, and simply the U.S. government's role in the world is just um, much larger than it had been. So you have a lot of ambassadors, you have a lot of diplomats, uh, consuls stationed all over the world um, in numbers that they hadn't before, who are much more involved in, in foreign affairs generally. Um, the American Red Cross um, continues to play a major role in U.S. international aid and international disaster aid. Um, but one of the other interesting elements of World War II is that you have a lot of other organizations um, appear on the scene. Um, some of them are older, some of them are newer. NGOs like CARE, um, Church World Service, Catholic Relief Services. Um, these organizations um, um, do a lot of work during the Second World War. Um, and they, like the Red Cross, forge these partnerships with the U.S. government um, that are really um, mutually beneficial. Um, the, these organizations get from the U.S. government um, access to things like surplus commodities um, and, and free um, or um, subsidies to help them ship aid abroad. Um, and the U.S. government, in turn, gets these organizations who are willing to um, work with the government uh, to, to um, discuss um, shared goals with the State Department um, to, to ensure that they're fulfilling U.S. national security interests uh, in other places. Um, and these organizations will continue to work with the government um, in the aftermath of World War II um, in a sort of new partnership um, that expands the U.S. government's um, essentially number of, of voluntary partners out there. Um, so all of these changes just make, uh, essentially enable the United States to respond to disasters much more quickly, um, much more um, with a lot more um, funding, with a lot more assistance um, than they ever had before, um, uh, even in the early 20th century. So it really does transform uh, the United States humanitarian power uh, mm -hmm. as well as his other forms of world power. I think that when a lot of people consider U.S. foreign aid in general, but specifically uh, disaster assistance now, one of the first things that comes to mind is USAID, the Agency mm -hmm. for International Development. Um, but but that did not exist 100 years ago. When When did USAID come to be? How has it shifted organizationally uh, in the last several decades, and how does it relate to other organizations that grew up and popped down and evolved after World War II? So USAID was founded in 1961, um, and its creation is in chapter 12 of 13 in this book. So one of the things I really want to make an argument here in this book is that um, the U.S. government's involvement in foreign aid, uh, foreign disaster aid, but really foreign aid more broadly, um, well predates not only USAID, but also the Marshall Plan, these other kinds of things that we often think of as, as foundational moments in, in U.S. foreign aid. Um, so USAID is founded in 1961, um, but it's not the first U.S. federal aid agency. Um, after World War II, um, there are actually attempts to, there's a sort of sense that um, the U.S. government should be more involved in foreign aid, that there should be this kind of permanent part of the U.S. government um, that is doing foreign assistance, um, that this longstanding reliance on the American Red Cross um, to essentially be the U.S. government's foreign aid arm uh, is maybe a bit outdated and that, that the government should have more control over, over aid itself. So this begins with, um, you know, we see, for instance, the, the Marshall Plan, uh, the European Recovery Program, um, and then shortly thereafter in 1949, something that's called the Point Four Program. Um, this is uh, known because uh, Harry Truman uh, in, in his 1949 inaugural, um, it was the fourth point in his speech, um, but it became known as point four. Point four was the earliest kind of technical assistance or what we might call development assistance um, project for the U.S. Um, so both the Marshall Plan and point four are really early um, post-war foreign aid organizations, and there's a bureaucracy kind of surrounding them. Um, but by the time we get to the 1950s, 
um, under the Eisenhower administration. There's um, two different organizations. The first is the Foreign Operations Administration and then the International Cooperation Administration, uh, which is founded in 1955. Um, and this is really, these are the, the precursors essentially to USAID. So you have this experimentation with these, these federal aid agencies during the 1950s. Um, and then when the Kennedy administration comes in, there's a sense that there's a lot of problems with them. There, there, there's debates over where the aid should go, who has control. Mm -hmm. um, so USAID is kind of Kennedy's attempt to fix all of these issues and really centralize um, non-military foreign assistance under one, one agency. Before you go on, am I right that all of those organizations um, were in some way linked to the State Department. They weren't completely independent, but they were linked in <laughs> in various fashions to diplomatic leadership. Yeah, and it, and it goes, it changes for each of them, right? And this is actually one of the major debates about like how closely linked should USAID or other uh, right. USAID and its predecessors be to the State Department. And and there's a lot of debates within um, among policymakers over this. Um, a lot of people in the foreign aid field want to be uh, as separate as possible um, from the State Department, right? Believing that humanitarian assistance should not be dictated by national security concerns, um, but rather by you know real humanitarian concerns. Uh, and then on the other hand, there are those, especially within the State Department and Congress, uh, who think that that foreign aid is is absolutely about national security, and that um, the that USAID needs to be much closer and and sort of under the wing of the State Department. Um, so these actually these are major debates that are kind of going on in the fifties and early sixties about you know what USAID should do, how it should be operating, what what its mission really is, and and whose interests it should be serving the U.S. governments or uh, populations in need of aid. So this is uh, this is kind of part of those uh, those debates. Uh, USAID is created as a sort of uh, semi-autonomous agency, so it's not just you know straight under the State Department, um, right. but but has a lot more autonomy um, than, than some of its predecessors as well. Eventually, um, and this is kind of the the big gotcha of this whole conversation. Um, eventually, the United States government gets around to actually making all of this clearly legal, <laughs> and that is to say that there have been you know congressional authorizations of funds for disaster relief. There's been the setup of funds for diplomats to use at their discretion. There's been immense deference to the executive in many cases to pursue national interests through foreign disaster assistance. But it's not until 1975 that there's actually a a clear piece of legislation governing this, right? Yeah, and uh, one of one of the quotes that, that made me laugh out loud when I came across it in the archives, um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember exactly, but at some point in the 1950s, a U.S. military commander is talking in this meeting and he says, the military, the U.S. military is accused of breaking a lot of laws, um, but I don't think we ever break so many laws as when we do disaster relief operations. <laughs> it's this really, really remarkable kind of observation, which is absolutely true. There's this sort of, there, there isn't the kind of legislative authority for a lot of what is happening in this book isn't clear cut. Um, so starting in the sixties and into the early seventies, there's a sense that, um, Disaster relief is something that the U.S. government does. It's a norm. It's it's happened for decades, um, and there should be more um, effort to to really codify this in uh, federal law. So, the first um, Foreign Assistance Act in 1961, uh, which is really the the it, it, we, we continue to operate foreign aid continues to operate under updated and revised and amended versions of the Foreign Assistance Act. Um, so it's created in 1961, the same year as USAID. Um, it takes until 1975 before um, there is a, a chapter um, on international disaster assistance that is actually added to the Foreign Assistance Act. Um, so before then, they're kind of you know, figuring out how to, you know, they're, they're operating, right, obviously in the world um, without this, this uh, specific language. Um, but there's a lot of push from people within USAID to kind of have this language added. And so this is this happens in, in 1975 and, and late in the year, they finally get this, uh, uh, this chapter that really outlines the U.S. government's responsibilities um, and various, um, the, the responsibilities of various parts of the U.S. federal government um, when international disasters occur. Um, and so this is this mm -hmm. kind of interesting moment uh, that we really see it made part of a federal law. So bringing this up to the current day, there's a few things that, you know, reflecting on your research and writing occur to me, and I'd love to get your take on these thoughts. First of all, there is 
something that I, and I'm not sure it's historically unique, but it certainly is much more dramatic in the last couple of decades than anything I see in the longer history that, that you've uncovered. And that is, we saw it most prominently with former presidents Bush and Clinton doing the uh, international relief for Haiti and then other things around the world, including the, the tsunami in the Indian Ocean. We saw it in 2017 when most of the former and living presidents went to Texas A&M to do a huge fundraiser for the triple hurricanes of Harvey Irma and Maria. Um, I don't recall James Madison in his post-presidency doing a lot of fundraising for American private organizations and relief organizations, but it seems like that's become the norm since the 1990s in particular. So I'd like your, your take on that, both in terms of how interesting that is as a historian seeing that development, but what it points out that it's still U.S. government affiliated figures, former, yes, but U.S. government affiliated celebrities, but raising money for private efforts to, to aid with foreign disasters. Yeah, no, that's that's a really fantastic observation, and I, you know, I'm interested in it as well. I mean, I, I will say, while sort of um, former presidents weren't necessarily doing this quite as much in, in the 20th century, the period in my book, there are a lot of examples of sitting presidents um, raising money or, or trying to raise money, especially for the American Red Cross, um, but for other organizations as well. So when disasters happen, um, there's a lot of presidential proclamations um, by most of the sitting presidents urging the American public to donate money uh, to the American Red Cross mm -hmm. uh, to come to the aid because so much of this uh, foreign assistance is not funded through taxpayer dollars, especially early on, but through the donations of the American public. Um, so you do have kind of presidents urging the American public to act uh, using the, their kind of that official capacity to to encourage that, um, not just to to give to the government, but to to give to private causes as well. Um, you know, I think the the sort of after lives of, of presidencies, you know, part of it is that presidents are, are you know, <laughs> living longer, right? And then you know, have have more time to kind of have this sort of post-presidential legacy that, that you're mentioning too. Um, it's interesting, you know, I think, and it goes back to this idea that disaster relief, especially, is is often seen as um, bipartisan and apolitical in this way that other types of U.S. international involvement are not. I um, mean, I think that this moment of like coming together, you know, bringing again Bush and Clinton together to uh, to fundraise um, is, is is really kind of um, they wouldn't necessarily be doing this for uh, for uh, victims of a conflict, right, uh, or or for other kinds of international affairs um, in a way that it's, it's, it's so much easier for us to imagine them doing this in, in times of, mm -hmm. of disaster. Um, and that tells us something about the kind of special nature that, that we, we think about disasters. Another thing that I want to get your, your take on is that there is this belief that, you know, looking back at this history, especially some of the earlier cases, you know, it, it seems so quaint, right? It's this it's this ambassador, um, sometimes virtually alone in the country and you know, getting out there and and putting hands on the situation and and personally managing this and oh how silly those old times were where we had to deal with issues of you know domestic restraint and local realities and inadequate mechanisms and yet we're dealing with those same things today. It's on a different scale, but it's not as if there is a magic perfect solution for how to handle a natural disaster and foreign aid relief. So. How much do you think we collectively as a government, as a society, how much have we learned about how to do this best? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, I think one of the, the sort of universal truths about disasters, right, is that they're, they're not... Uh, they are not simple events. They are very complex events, um, and and as much as you plan um, for these these events, there there's still so many sort of unexpected things that happen. Uh, they are these contingencies. Even if you know that a disaster is likely to occur in a certain place, um, you don't know. You know, you don't really know when that earthquake will strike, or what damage it will cause, or who will be affected, or what the the multiple sort of ripple effects will be. I do think you know in the in the late twentieth, early twenty first century, there's there's a lot more um, expertise and awareness um, and ability to to kind of plan, um, not only in the U.S. government but certainly, especially within the international community. Um, so there's 
Um, you know, in the last 50 years or so, there's just been so much more um, focus within the UN and its agencies, as well as other international NGOs um, on issues of not only disaster relief, um, but what's called disaster risk reduction. So taking steps ahead of time to mitigate the risks of disaster, to help people prepare for disasters, um, which do which does save a lot of lives, um, you know, in, in the long term. So these are things that we don't often see. Um, preparedness isn't uh, headline grabbing, right? This, this idea that you're preparing for something is not a, a headline grabbing uh, as as uh, these sort of major death tolls following sure. disasters, but it's incredibly important. Um, mm-hmm. And and so this sort of behind the scenes work is is ensuring that fewer people do um, die or or, um, or are injured when disasters happen, that there is less destruction. Mm-hmm. But obviously, um, as, as our headlines tell us, these things continue, right? So we have not figured out uh, how to solve or resolve all of these problems by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and in some ways, things have become more complicated. You know, it, there's there's an ease, I think, uh, the, the sort of quaint earlier version that you're discussing of a few people on the ground who are making these decisions. Um, the landscape now, um, if a major disaster occurs, there's, there's dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, voluntary organizations from different countries, from, you know, some are faith-based, some are secular, uh, mm-hmm. some are representing governments, some are not, some are representing the UN, and the, the kind of crowded nature of that scene can make coordination much more difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's one of the challenges, I think, of, of coordination that, that we run into these days, too. I'd like to uh, close the substance here by looping back to something you brought up near the beginning about the the cultural side of this, that you know, just you shake your head when you think that did they really make a roller coaster out of the, the disaster <laughs> yeah, in Martinique? They really did. Um, because it seems an extraordinarily bad taste. I mean, imagine in in our times if there were a a water park that made a ride out of the Japanese tsunami. It just mm-hmm. it just feels wrong. Yeah. But it does point to that issue in in the manner in which you raised it, which is some of these disasters really resonate with people more than others. And I have yet to find a great pattern, right? It's not, it's not always the ones that occur in the countries where the greatest number of Americans find their heritage. It's not always about the ones that are geographically most proximate. Um, I'm wondering if you've seen any pattern in cultural, cultural resonance of these disasters and then in the way that they are portrayed, whether in media or in more wide pop culture like amusement rides. Yeah. This book would have been much easier to write if I could have found a pattern in some ways. Um, Because, yeah, I mean, this was really something that I struggled with a lot, too. And and it's a question people have sort of asked. And I think it's a, you know, what is the if I were a political scientist, I would probably need a a much more uh, clear theory on this. Um, but as a historian, I get to say things are messy and complicated. Um, but I think, you know, it's it's really one of the things that, that really struck me about this book is that it's really hard to predict which which crises will capture the imagination and which will not. Um, and it is this combination of factors. Um, a lot of times, you know, an affinity to a place, you know, people have this sense of connection that certainly motivates it. Um, a lot of times I think it's, you know, if it's a slow news day, if there's not other things going on and people are paying attention, that that helps them kind of be aware. Uh, certainly the the levels of death and destruction and I think the suddenness of, of that event um, do um, kind of capture people's imaginations. Um, and, and that tells us, you know, something about, I, I think, the, the sort of the ways that people imagine um, these, these sudden disasters as opposed to, say, a long drawn out drought or, or famine that's, it's, you know, um, has, has much slower sort of effects. Um, so I think all of these play a role, but there's also just sort of no predicting um, which disasters will really um, uh, capture yeah. people's attention and which will not. Um, and and that's a really it's it's a you know challenging thing to uh, mm-hmm. to for historians, but also for for aid workers today, right? How do you um, how do you combat what people call compassion fatigue um, and make sure that when the next disaster happens, people are are paying attention and aren't simply mm-hmm. um, tuned out because they've been paying too much attention to other things happening in the world. Do you have any disaster movies or books or other forms of art that you actually like, or are you uh, <laughs> repulsed by them and find yeah. them to be too I trite? find them fascinating. You know, I, uh, you know, I watched um, early on in this, I decided to watch Waterworld because I'd never mm. watched it. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's as bad as you think, <laughs> or as you remember. Yeah. So, um, it's, um it's yeah. definitely an experience. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love the idea behind the movie. It's one of those where the concept is interesting, but 
I, I don't like the way they play the story out at all. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. It's a, it was a, it was a, it was a, you know, I felt like I was doing research watching it though. So, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I find this sort of, you know, the disasters really, you know, they are, um, it's, it's, I think the disaster film genre is is such a you know it, it was really big in the seventies and eighties, but certainly we we see you know things mm-hmm. like asteroid and you know, this this obsession right. with this story of disaster I think is is really common. So I don't tend to watch all that many disaster movies. Um, I am intrigued by by sort of disaster art. There's really some beautiful mm-hmm. um, you know the Great Kanto earthquake for instance. Um, right. Just the the outpouring of like beautiful beautiful um, art from Japanese artists at the time, really trying to make sense of this catastrophe mm-hmm. and. And its effects and so i mean these beautiful like woodblock prints that kind of come out of this yeah. they really capture people's i mean just the emotion that you can kind of see in, in some of this art uh, is really striking so you know i think there are these sort of moments of people trying to make sense of tragedy through art that are, are really um beautiful in, a, in this kind of timely uh, timeless sort of way sure. um, that that are kind of pretty amazing well let me reach into our chatter box right. to ask you one of our questions here Julia, who is someone in your field or a related one whose work more people should be following? No, oh, that's a that is a very good question. Oh, there's so many that I want to uh, that I want to highlight. So, um, you know, the the work of um, Jacob Remus, uh, who wrote a wonderful book on um, a major disaster, two major disasters that occurred, um, one in Halifax, a major explosion. Uh, and then one in the Northeast United States. Um, and the kind of connections uh, in the early early 20th century, this is kind of between um, between people in Canada and the United States and the, the emotional connections they felt. Oh, wow. uh, he looks a lot at this question of solidarity. Um, mm-hmm. So whereas my book is looking, especially top down, this sort of sense of like what the US government is doing, what major right. officials are doing, he's looking at working class people um, and the, the ways that they looked out for one another um, both within their own communities, but also the kind of connections they forge with other working class people uh, in in um, you know across the border um, because of their shared experience with with disaster, because of their shared experience with with condescending relief workers, um, and I think this kind of this ground level um, bottom up story that he tells is a really um, beautiful look at. Um, at disaster survivors and and the ways that they um, you know empower themselves uh, in the aftermath of catastrophe. So that is that is one book I would certainly point to. That is a great one. We will we will provide a link to that in our show notes. Um, Julia, I want I want to thank you for spending so much time you know talking through your your work and its implications for writing catastrophic diplomacy, the the history of U.S. foreign disaster assistance, but also for writing making the world safe about the American. Red Cross. We appreciate it. My pleasure. And thank you for the conversation. I really enjoyed it. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.